All right, Stuart Murdoch, welcome to Studio Q. It's lovely to be here. Great to have you here. So let's talk about um, your new record, specifically the title I want to start with, Girls in Peacetime Want to Dance. Sort of evocative and, and kind of emblematic of what this record sounds like. There's, there's more dance grooves than ever before and more lyrics about, about world events. Uh, why did you want to get into politics a little bit more? I mean, it's still sort of about the role that politics plays in people's lives. It's still the personal stories, but why did you want to sort of spread into that direction? Oh, I think that was just, a, it was a natural uh, evolution for, for the group and, uh, it's been a while since we've made a record. It's been a while since we've written a group of songs. And so the, the, hopefully a natural maturing of, of minds. Uh, the, the band, you know, instead of just sitting and talking about the, the Rolling Stones, that we, we do actually sit and talk about issues that affect us. And uh, there's a lot. We were just chatting a minute ago about the referendum in Scotland. And we had a year of intense debate about new futures, about sort of halcyon nations that could exist and uh and so the, the, these sort of thoughts are some of the things that maybe have gone into the record there's a line in the song ali that goes ali what would you do when there's bombs in the middle east you want to hurt yourself so it's sort of about you're still telling individual stories but applying the bigger picture sort of looking outward a bit more i think by I think when you generalize, I find it hard to generalize. I, I think um, other people do that way better than me, you know, and that's a kind of stadium band thing. And I can't really do that. I always end up coming back to the personal and telling a story through people. With Ali, I, I actually thought, I started that song and it felt like a good thing. It was a natural urge. I actually thought I was on pretty shaky ground because I was painting an image of a person who was being radicalized, um, who was staying in their their room, who was on the internet all the time, was in Britain somewhere and was, was perhaps being radicalized. So I'm suggesting this person is, um, you know, maybe being radicalized by Islam or, you know, world events and feeling this pressure from all around and maybe not having enough connection with normal people. And so their, their mind, and I, I thought, I don't really know enough about this to be writing about it, but it, the, the song was written and, and then you know, which was a year or so ago, and and and, and events have actually in Britain have actually um, it, the, the song doesn't feel far fetched anymore. Mm -hmm. That 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 young people from from Britain can feel so uh, isolated and 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 moved by world events. And that's the it's interesting. That's your way into it. You don't feel the confidence to sort of opine about the big picture, but you can still get at those those issues through a, a very personal character. Yes, I mean, you, you, you're, on, you're always on steady ground when you're talking about things that have happened to yourself. That's the first thing. That's terrific. You can write about that all you want. And then people that you know, that then it goes to people you know and you feel pretty good about that. And then there's people that you just see around and then you start kind of generalizing and it gets a little bit tricky. But you know, with the, I, I made a film recently and, and, uh, and I felt... You know, that I'd been carrying these characters around with me and they were real characters and I was very comfortable talking from the point of view of the characters. And I think that's something that continued with with Ali and with um, Cat with the Cream. I um, wonder if um, the the ripe old age of, of, of being in your 40s is, is playing a role too and you're sort of expanding. Or as one of your bandmates, um, Chris Geddes, told the Japan Times, he thought maybe this was because you're a father now. Are you thinking about the world and how it affects individuals in a different way? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I think, uh, I think maybe Chris sees it better than me. He has a bit of a, a, you know, an objective probably seeing me as a dad. I'm just, um, you know, I'm just going, going through that particular thing. And, but it, I, I, of course it does affect you. It makes you grow up a little bit more. Um, you sometimes said that when songwriters write about politics, it can be very, very boring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that. Do you sort of, do you set out parameters for yourself to, to check for boringness? <laughs> or do, you, do you have to really be, be mindful you know, of that? You, you check and balance on the sure, boring? Not, not, not so much. It's, it's so funny because when I was making my film, I spent a, a, a long time making a, a feature film and um, we went through so many process of showing it to the, showing it to crowds of people at 
various times during the editing process and we got feedback and some of it was really withering feedback, you know, the people that sort of hated the film and pointing out what's wrong with it and really taking me to task. But you go through that process and you make a better film through it. And um, somebody that used to work at our record label said, if only they did that with records. <laughs> you know, could you imagine, you know, because... Bands, focus group, they're Focus accurate. groups, because bands don't get to do that, you know, and, and, and you know, bands are a, a sort of have an autonomy and, uh, well, uh, you know, at least successful bands do and they just make their record and they, they put it out in in the world. So the, the, there's quite a difference there. Uh, so so maybe, the, may, maybe going through the film process has caused us to, you know, question our quality control um, a little bit. One of the songs that references politics a little bit is, is Nobody's Empire. But it's also a very personal song about your 20s, which was a really significant time for you. You had something a lot of people refer to as chronic fatigue, uh, a sort of a disease that's abbreviated as ME. Why did you wait until now to really write about that experience in such a personal way? Yeah, it was not really a choice. It just kind of it came out. To be honest, the, I guess what I was doing when I made my film, the 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 overall specter behind the film was the specter of Emmy, the the thing that happened to me. And and I think once I'd finally finished the film, I suddenly had this feeling that I I wanted to write a song that was much more personal. It was just me, my experiences, rather than couching it in metaphors and and, and characters. And um, so it just. It came out all of a sudden. I think also it didn't help that the fact that in the last couple of years I've had a relapse from yeah. from the condition, which was a little bit, you know, shocking to me to get have to get used to all that stuff again. Tell me what that was like because um, I imagine that I mean that's the biggest. Fear. I had cancer, and my biggest fear is having to face that down again. And I, I I tremble even thinking about what emotionally that was like for you to think. It's back. I think it's obviously. I, I I don't know much so much about the cancer experience. And, no, but and, and I mean anything that that upends your life sure. and is is emotionally devastating, and you soldier and you get through it, and then it comes back. I thought it was. I really thought it was um, behind me for so many years, and it it wasn't until a, a, a few things happened that I you know I realized it it actually it, it made me certainly the person I was and was really ruling my life all the time to the point where I still couldn't, even though I was pretty healthy, I couldn't have a relationship and I had to live on my own and I had all these kind of rules to stay healthy. And, but, you know, life is not like that. Life is chaotic. And and so, you know, getting married and having a kid and making a film, all this stuff is, you know, has had a bit of a, a knock-on effect. But I don't regret any of that stuff. You just... You know, and I don't, I, I don't feel like I'm back to, back to square one. Uh, because you're older, at least you have the experience, the mental experience. It makes you tough. And you've been through it, so yeah. you can handle it better the second time. And that's why I wrote the song because the song is about getting through it the first time, and and so it was a defiant song. Mm-hmm. What did a typical day look like for you when you had me? Because, I mean, a lot of people, you know, sure, they hear sure. chronic fatigue, oh, you're really bagged, you can't get up and do yeah, stuff. Yeah, but, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's hard to imagine. Of course, it's a, exactly, it's a sliding scale. In the first year, I was bedbound and, and I, I went through a terrible time and I actually lost a lot of weight and I was that, that was a big side issue for me. And, and um, But slowly, I, you know, my, so my life had absolutely changed and give it, given up sort of work and university and, and, and all my friends, you know, just to... St- live back at my parents but um so this new life starts for you and it sort of creeps in and it just go, you, you you're living it's sort of like a pensioner i would imagine where you you just kind of uh, plan out your days around very small things getting out for an hour in the afternoon it's very it's rather pathetic you know for a 20 something but that's um we, but you got to you got to laugh about it. There's a there's a show in a famous show in in Britain called Last of the Summer Wine. I don't know if it ever made it out here. I don't know. And it, it's about uh, it's about um, the life of the sort of three pensioners in the Yorkshire Dales. Uh, you know they're they're really old and really creaky and they have funny adventures. Well, we 
our, me and my ME pals were the only, you have to have ME pals because they're the only people that go at the same pace at you as you. And we always felt like we were in the cast of Last of the Summer Wine. <laughs> I get, did it affect you kind of uh, on a spiritual level? I mean, there is something about being in the moment and setting limited goals for yourself. I wonder, did you ta- sort of take some positive out of that, that you, you, you appreciate what you can do? Absolutely, that you you have to be, uh, you have to be violently positive when <laughs> when this is stuff like this has happened, and I think it's no fluke that um, you know the a sense of spirituality sort of sparked off in me. I think it's a it, in a practical way if you think about it, when a person uh, has has most aspects of their life stripped away, then. S- suddenly you're looking at the, the bare bones of life and and uh, so you know you're wondering about life and and so for me luckily I I, I had a, the gift of faith sort of rose up in me and was an accompaniment and that's that's never gone away and that's that's been a great thing well the other thing that rose up for you during that time which is really interesting is your songwriting I mean when you had Emmy the first time in your 20s and you were so housebound and all the things you described that's when you started writing songs why do you think it took an, until then I mean that's sort of late for a lot of songwriters you were kind of in your mid-20s sure sure uh, no it must be said that this uh, this illness this circumstance absolutely made me who I am and and I couldn't write a song to save my life before that time I tried <laughs> because I was obviously I was very keen on music but in the same way that spirituality crept in the, the music crept in as well and uh, I I felt like I needed to say something and describe my circumstances and I sat down at the piano and wrote my first song. You called it, um, in an interview with Pitchfork, you called it a big clearing of the mind. You said that's when the opportunity to write comes in. What was behind that? Were you trying to, what were you trying to clear away? No, 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 I wasn't. I think maybe that was confusing. I wasn't trying to clear anything. I think that thing that I described about life falling away, Mm -hmm. um, uh, distractions falling away that was the clearing that, that happened the, the to me of my mind. and okay. suddenly you have you have nothing except time and damp scottish afternoons <laughs> just a long time until dinner you know so you can weirdly be appreciative of this condition that befell you because of how much it changed your life well, well looking back on it now it's a rosy it's now it seems like a rosy time. I mean, you are, it, you do get the rose tinted specks on and you, luckily, uh, you know, when you look back 20 years, it is the good stuff if you remember. And, and it, the song is, a lot of it is about my best friend, Kira, who was also, who was my soulmate at the time. And the two of us went through this together. Um, so, you know, the fact that she got better and she had a family was amazing. And the songs just poured out of you. I mean, you had two records out in 1996. <laughs> the songs sort of poured out of you, you you said. Yes, I think, I, I mean, I, there was a long gap between, you know, this time and then the band coming along. It, you know, I had about f- five years recovery and and stockpiling songs and working out my ideas. And uh, so when, but when the group actually did come along, that that was a great catalyst. It sparked me off into you know, saying things that I, I, I wouldn't have said before. You once said, the best songs serve a definite purpose to the person who is writing them. <laughs> so what song, or sorry, what purpose um, do you think the song served? I mean, we've understood sort of how you got to being able to create them, but what purpose did they serve, do you think, for you at that time? Um, ah, that's a good question. Being confronted with your own quotes is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> is always a danger, isn't it? They did, the, the songs actually felt like the meat and strong drink of my life. It was, it was suddenly, it was my work. It was something solid, even though they, they're ethereal and they live in air. It was still something solid that I could, I could sort of build up. And that felt very, very good for somebody who didn't really have anything to have these like typed A4 sheets of paper with, uh, with lyrics on them representing songs. So that, that, and, and you know that's a good thing, um, but also just in, in general, and it's still going. You 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 write songs for consolation and for maybe what your life is missing. You try to make up for it in 
in songs and um, and you, you write about things that you desire and you make up mystical situations for yourself. It's all a little bit pathetic, but <laughs> but um, yeah, I think I I think people do that stuff in other ways, you know, and they, um, you know, by watching films or going to the gym or you know, I don't know, or supporting a a ball club, you know. <laughs> Let's talk for a minute about how you came through the your chronic fatigue, the ME. You've attributed your recovery to a faith healer. Can you talk about what happened? Absolutely, and that was it was uh, documented in in the film in God Help the Girl as well. I used that particular strand, but but it did actually it did actually happen. I, I had a few years of just going nowhere. My condition never got better. I was seeing all sorts of different alternative therapist and I think a fellow promised me that he would make me better and 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 charged me a lot of money and and after six months said that he couldn't he simply couldn't help me and and that felt like a this weird betrayal and and so I really I, suddenly I got into the situation for the first time I, I got depressed about it you know I didn't realize that and so but I went to see I went to see this woman that I heard about on the other side of Glasgow who who did healing and she did healing in hospitals and she used to cut hair in hospitals and she gave people healing while she was doing it and she didn't even talk about it. But I, so, and she didn't, she didn't even charge any money. Um, you know, she said, give, you know, give me what you can, a donation. So I gave her five pounds because <laughs> I was I didn't have any money. So yeah, we did some healing and, and, um, and, if, you know, it felt good. It felt it felt calming and good, and I thought nothing much of it. And uh, this is sort of what the therapeutic touch, sort of hands above your yeah, hands above body. That's just right. Energy healing, just energy healing. Okay. And then a a week or so later, I was back at my parents' house, and my folks had gone on holiday, and I was left alone. And suddenly, I just I freaked out. I just absolutely freaked out. What did that look like? It was ugly. You know, like just. But what do you mean by freaking well, out? Well, just I mean, really had an extreme panic attack, and uh, and that was the start of uh, of a of a, of a two year you know battle with anxiety and depression. It was just like you know, it's like spirits coming out. But you know, at the time it was it's hellish. It was worse than the ME itself. But um, and uh, you know, it was on all kinds of medication for years. But but the, the the thing is now I can look back on it, and I and I I absolutely swear that the that going to see that woman brought something out. Turned a corner. Turned a corner. Um, because although uh, mentally it was fraught for the next couple of years, my, my physical health started to improve. Um, and, you know, so... Did you continue to see her? No. I, 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 I tried to go... I tried to go back and see her maybe about three years later because, like I said, I didn't realize that she had done any good. And I spoke to her neighbors and she said she'd moved and they didn't know where she'd gone. And I asked her around and nobody knows where she went. So so you've never contacted her since or I, been I've, able to thank I've her? I've tried to, but I've never been able to. Yeah, her name was Margaret. Did you think about her when it came back? Um, you know, not specifically her, but there's always people that... I'm I'm always looking for healers. I know that sounds weird. No, but it's, I don't think it does. You know, because you're always, I mean, you know, my job on the side is to, you know, I've got to, um, you know, do stuff for my health all the time and I do Chinese medicine. But I'm seriously, I feel like sometimes I, you know, I walk up to somebody, are you... Have you got something of the healer in you? I'm, I'm game. I'm open. If anybody claims that they've got, you know, I'll try them out. <laughs> you I have an felt, open mind. I always felt like I, I said to my wife, you know, that that if I wasn't doing this job, I would like to have a go at it myself because, um, you know, I just think if you have that kind of empathy um, and I don't have that much energy, but I feel it's something I could do is like channeling some sort of healing healing thing. Maybe I'll try it out with the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Send your energy through the, way, uh, yeah. through the radio airwaves. So I'm curious, you talked about your songs almost coming out fully formed. You had such a productive period as a result of your chronic fatigue all those years ago. So how, how, do you, how do you write songs now? I mean, how do songs come out now? Is it harder? For years, I never thought I would, this would be my job. Uh, I never predicted the band. I, there's so much about 
what happened that I never thought would happen. I thought perhaps we'd we'd make one LP or I'd make one LP and then I'd, you know, go on to something else. It would be a catharsis. But what happened was the band happened and this interesting group of eight, eight or so people sort of came into your life and, and, and suddenly that became your life. And, it, you know, thank God it did because um, there's nothing like people to, you know, to G you up and, uh, you know, it became like a second family. To G you up. To G you up. I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that a Scottish phrase? I think probably just, a, yeah, just a random Scottish to phrase. I don't up. know what it means. All right. Uh, <laughs> so, um and that that's really been the narrative for the past uh, twenty years is is all the interesting circumstances of of doing this job and traveling the world and um you know with with still this obviously there's still this thing in, lingering in the in the background to give me plenty of um plenty of material I would wager that it's that openness that you talked about to being so open to various healers is probably part of why. These things have happened to you that have G'd you up. Yeah, you've got. <laughs> it, it, it's true. You become a spectator. I, I definitely became a voyeur, or 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 whatever the more pleasant version of voyeur is, and and you know, looking at people's lives and being able to empathise and 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 you know, maybe speak for them, but then extrapolate from very small details, and and you know, that's that that can become a song. It's trickier. It's tricky. I, I don't know if I'd ever be able to write a novel because that's a different beast, you know, writing extrapolated stories, but um, but it's good for songs. All right, I'm going to pull an, your quote out at you again. Um, I'm going to make you regret having said this, but that line, the best songs serve a definite pers- purpose to the person who's writing them. So let's talk about this new record then. What purpose did these songs on this record serve for you now? Yeah, that's a, that is a good question. Well, the first song that I wrote for this particular group um, was called "The Everlasting Muse," um, and it was actually a. I realised I hadn't, I didn't have any songs for the. We were just about to get back together with the band, and I was on tour. We were on tour in Switzerland, and uh, I thought, I really want to. Uh, I wish the muse would show up and give me a pile of songs. I haven't done this for a while, and so I thought I'd write a song. Um, for the muse or or to the muse, inviting her into <laughs> uh, you know into the writing process. So I think that it definitely did serve a purpose to uh, you know to get us going as a, as a catalyst. Um, and then, but a lot of the songs on this record came from different members of the group, um, which is obviously uh, a great inspiration to get to get to have so many ideas coming from different directions. And, um, you know, so Stevie would bring in ideas and they would combine with Chris and and, and Bob wrote his first song for the group, which is called The Party Line, which became our kind of lead off. The first single. Lead off track, yeah. yeah. And uh, so um, I, um, I wouldn't like to speak for Bob. I don't quite know what the pur- his purpose of it. He, he just does like a really good dance tune. Yeah. <laughs> All right. When you look back at your career thus far, how well do you think your songs hold up um, by comparison with, you know, other musicians that you admire? Well, I think they don't. And this is, (laughs) you know, this is, um, I think they fall so short. And I I don't mean that in a kind of false modesty. There's There's a quality to them. I mean, there's some sort of quality to them or else people wouldn't come to the concerts. But there's a there's a sort of permanence, there's a um, there's a beauty and craft to the likes of a Paul Simon song or um, a Bacharach song. Many of many of those that is um, I think is a step ahead, uh, and that's what we're always aiming for. That's personally what I'm always aiming for. But then not just not just that tradition of of men in in pop in the '60s. You know, there's there's many tracks all the way down through history individual tracks I you know I love pop music from from the 50s right up to present day that amaze me and I, I you know I get blown away and I get jealous by something I hear you know when I'm walking through h and um, <laughs> but it's great it's a constant gauntlet thrown down I think back to the muse call her up again the Keep muse yeah, yeah 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 please don't desert me <laughs> So great to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jill.